joining us for our live coverage of an update from NASA on the scrub that occurred yesterday of the Artemis One wet dress rehearsal. NASA scheduled to hold this conference in just a couple minutes time to provide an update on the final major test of the agency's mega moon rocket and Orion spacecraft out at Launch Complex 39B. This is an uncrewed mission they're counting down to. Um, during the approximate two-day test known as the wet dress rehearsal, NASA encountered a issue Monday, April 4th with a panel on the mobile launcher that controls the core stage vent valve. The purpose of this valve is to relieve pressure from the rocket's core stage during tanking. NASA launch director made the call to stop the test, given time to resolve the issue as teams were nearing the end of their shifts. At the time of the test end, the team has loaded about 50% of the liquid oxygen onto the Space Launch System's core stage. Teams are now reviewing range availability and the time needed to turn systems around before determining another attempt to conduct a new wet dress rehearsal. Uh, on the call, we're going to hear from the Deputy Associated Administrator of the Exploration Systems Development from NASA Headquarters in Washington. We're going to hear from the Artemis Mission Manager from NASA Headquarters. We're going to hear from the Artemis Launch Director, uh, who is down at Kennedy Space Center. So this call is about to begin in about two minutes' time, and we'll patch that in. We are on the line with NASA, so if you guys have questions, drop those in the chat, tag us at the launch pad. We're going to be saving those and try to include them if we get a chance to ask some questions uh, here today on uh, what actually all occurred during the test uh, and everything like that. So make sure you tag us at the launch pad in those uh, and we will attempt to uh, ask a question there. But uh, expected to have this conference in about two minutes time. Take a moment, hit that like button and subscribe. It really does help us out as well and share out the broadcast because it's going to be really interesting to hopefully hear some updates from NASA on what occurred during this uh, this uh, rehearsal so stay with us right here on the launch pad they should begin shortly Good afternoon. I'm Katherine Hamilton with NASA's Office of Communications. The approximately two-day test, known as the wet dress rehearsal, began Friday, April 1st, and was stopped prior to tanking on Sunday, April 3rd. On a second run at tanking on Monday, April 4th, the team encountered an issue with a panel on the mobile launcher uh, that controls, controls the core stage vent valve and uh, stopped the test near the end of the day. Uh, the test is designed to demonstrate the ability to conduct a full launch countdown at Kennedy Space Center's launch pad launch complex 39B, including loading and draining cryogenic or super cold propellants into the Artemis 1 rocket. 
Uh, here to talk with us about the test and the path forward are Tom Whitmire, Deputy Associate Administrator for Common Exploration Systems Development at NASA Headquarters in, in Washington, Charlie Blackwell Thompson, Artemis Launch Director, Exploration Ground Systems Program at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, and Mike Serafin, Artemis One Mission Manager at NASA Headquarters. After a brief opening remarks from our speakers, we'll take your questions. You can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the question queue at any time. Your phones are on mute now, and the operator will open your mic when we're ready and close your mic after you ask your question. We do ask that you please stick to one question and identify to whom your question is directed. Uh, shortly after we conclude, you can listen to a replay of this teleconference online. So first, we'll go to Tom Whitmire. Okay, yeah, thank you, Catherine. Yeah, let me just talk for a few minutes and then I'll give it, uh, get it over to Charlie. I know you have a lot of questions that she'll be able to help you out with. It was, uh, I had a chance to be there with Charlie and Mike uh, yesterday. It was really cool to see the mega moon rocket sitting at the pad. And, you know, we uh, have our control rooms and our displays and our, our videos of what's going on. And uh, it was uh, very uh, interesting. I think that uh, Charlie does and her team just did an outstanding job. I can't compliment them enough on their professionalism and their coordination and their confidence as they go through this. Charlie will talk to you about the, uh, the things we did accomplish, and there were quite a few, and so that was a really uh, good opportunity to get some things behind us. Uh, there's a couple of things we learned that they're going to go ahead and clean up, and, and that's, that's the standard type of thing. We went, went through a lot of that at Green Run at Stennis. And then, uh, you know, the only other thing I was going to add is that at one point when we got into the initial cryo load, it was really a interesting to see um, how the team came together and handled this. I, you know, we talked about it being a dance and it's a highly choreographed dance and you have pressure volume and temperature and flow rates and pumps that you're trying to all work together to create the environment that you can feel the rocket and get into account. And sometimes you run into something that's a little different than what you were expecting. It's kind of like putting a puzzle together and you start to put the pieces in and it's not looking the way that you thought it should look. Well, they hold when they have a situation like that, they talk about it and they uh, decide what the right course of action is. It's to, to kind of recreate where they want to be, get to the image that they're looking for. They actually analyze that, come up with a plan. They have models that they verify the plan in, and they remove a couple of the pieces of the puzzle, some of the sequencing, and then back out of the operations just a little bit, and then they recreate the, the puzzle. And, the, and, and it was just incredible to see this happen. These folks are really outstanding. I, I couldn't be prouder for them. And so it was really a, a good a good test, and we'll we'll go back into it here in a little while, and uh, we'll continue um, as we go through wet dress rehearsal. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Charlie. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today and to talk about our progress during wet dress rehearsal. Um, you know, yesterday was a significant day for us, and as Tom said, our team accomplished quite a bit. Um, you know, this is a test, and the purpose of the test is to fully understand our systems in a day of launch configuration. And this was the first test in this configuration at the pad uh, with cryogenic. So it was a, it was a pretty big day uh, for us. Um, the wet dress rehearsal consists of several test objectives. We have two primary test objectives and five secondary. And one of our two primary uh, test objectives was completed with the work yesterday, and then three of the five secondaries are now complete. Um, we do have one that is partially complete and then one related to uh, the cryogenics piece that is, uh, remains open, and, and certainly the one uh, primary objective that remains open is related to the cryogenics, and so I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go forward. So as most of you know, we were here, um, I think, um, I forget which day we were here. I think we were <laughs> a few days ago, um, Sunday, and, uh, and we talked about uh, the work that had been done since call to stations, and just a quick kind of recap on that, our call to stations was on Friday. Uh, that set us up for a Sunday loading. We didn't actually get an opportunity to get into our loading operations that particular day. Uh, we had a supply fan issue, and we talked about that prior. Uh, so we stood down for 24 hours to understand uh, that capability or to, to recover that capability. The team did a really good job over the course of that 24 hours um, working that, uh, troubleshooting that and understanding it and getting us in a configuration uh, to proceed. So on Monday morning, just yesterday, we came in uh, and had our pre-tanking briefing and we were uh, 
got the go for tanking out of that meeting and uh, and the team prepared um, to get that into work just before our meeting or our briefing completed, we did find out that there had been a, an issue with the GNT supply to the center, and uh, and so that created a little bit of an issue for us. The the GNT supply went down uh, while they were troubleshooting that, and then then it came back up. And so around 10 a.m., um, we got uh, back into configuration. The team was ready to begin cryogenic uh, loading operations, and we started LOX chill down right around uh, 1040 local time. Um, we began pumping uh, LOX to the launcher just before 11 o'clock, and, uh, and then somewhere around about 1130 local time, we have um, some what we would call you know, built-in protections in our software system. It's called reactive control logic. And so we did get a stop in our software, a reactive control logic hit um, that, was, um, that was an anti-geyser uh, violation. And so uh, the team began looking into that and troubleshooting that and determined that it was due to the configuration of the core stage and the upper stage uh, ML um, piping. And, and after evaluating that, it was determined that um, just in the configuration of the lines, you end up getting a little bit of locks that goes up into that, uh, into that upper stage vertical column. And then as you change the pump speed on your locks pump, some of that warm locks will come back into the main fill stream of the core stage. And so some of the inlet temperatures there, we saw an excursion on. Uh, the team stopped, uh, took a look at the, the situation, uh, evaluated it and determined that we needed to load in a little bit different manner. And essentially what it consisted of is when we would change, as, as we go through our loading profile, we go from chill down, slow fill, fast fill, topping. And as you, as you go through those different phases of loading um, for locks, you, you end up changing your pump speed and the capacity in which you're pushing fluid uh, into the vehicle. So um, they went off and looked at, at how they could alter that and get into the loading operations, and, uh, and they were able to develop that procedure and put that into work. And we were able to load locks into the core stage for the very first time, and we got about, um, about halfway in our loading operations. Um, we did start uh, our preparations for LH2 loading, and we did encounter an issue, as Catherine described, uh, with the LH2 uh, pneumatic pressure panel at the pad. We utilize uh, pneumatic pressure or helium to activate the core stage vent valve that is required to get the LH2 to flow into the uh, core stage hydrogen tank. So um, we were at a point where uh, we did attempt uh, both our primary and our secondary valves, uh, but that um, did not resolve the issue, and we uh, decided that based on uh, the length of day and where we were in the LOX uh, loading profile, that uh, we would need to send a team into the pad to take a look at that panel and that configuration. So um, we stopped our cryogenic loading operations yesterday. Um, in addition to the LO2 loading that we did accomplish, um, we also were able to verify our Orion launch countdown configuration and checkout, our Orion day of launch uh, communications. Uh, we did our JSC commanding with uh, the uh, flight control team. We were able to do the upper stage flight control preps and the guidance checkout, um, booster power up and configuration, um, some of our core stage engine uh, purges and MPS checkouts, and uh, all of our range safety checkouts were complete. So there was quite a bit of our day of launch uh, configuration that was uh, completed. Uh, after the scrub, we went through our cutoff and safing, which is also an important thing, uh, and getting into our drain operations, which is something that we also wanted to demonstrate how we would work through that. Um, that was done successfully. And at this time, the vehicle, all of the elements of the flight hardware are powered down, Orion, ICPS, booster, and core stage. Uh, the ML configuration um, has all been saved. Um, the ML has been depressurized. We're, our ECS system is back on air from, from GN2 back to air. Uh, and, uh, and so we are, are currently in a good configuration out at the pad uh, to begin looking at uh, that next opportunity. And uh, so let's see, I think that's the summary of where we are today. And Mike, I can hand it to you. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Um, you know, as the uh, mission management team chair, you, you get a chance to sit back and, and watch the team work through these challenges. And, 
and um, deal with, you know, real physics and technical constraints on a very complex system uh, that's taken um, years to develop and produce and get to the launch pad. And uh, Tom said it at the outset that uh, this team has come together as one team. Uh, there's, there's remarkable teamwork going on. Uh, the vehicle sitting at the pad is, is a physical representation of how that team has come together. You know, the, the mobile launcher and the launch pad uh, is a great representation uh, with the launch control center off in the distance of the exploration ground systems team and our, and our launch operations team. The uh, space launch system rocket uh, that comes in the uh, form of the boosters, uh, the interim crowd propulsion stage, the upper stage, and the core stage, and the Liquid engines on board, uh, you know, represents the space launch system and the team out of uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center. And then the Orion spacecraft sitting on the top represents our team out at Houston. And, um, you know, the team has really come together, uh, not only through training, but through this test program and um, is demonstrated resilience, uh, remarkable technical discipline and toughness as they work through this, uh, these issues. And uh, Charlie outlined a whole myriad of, of technical challenges and issues um, that uh, we've had to overcome, in addition to environmental issues like the, the uh, weather uh, over the past weekend. Um, I'll say that there's a lot of learning going on, and we're a learning organization, and we take pride in learning from these tests, and, and we're taking the time to apply those lessons learned and roll those into the next attempt, and, um, and we're going we're gonna to get past a partially successful test that we had earlier this week, and we, and we um, anticipate that we'll have a fully successful test in short order here. So that's it for me. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. We will now <coughs> begin with our question and answer portion. Again, please stick to one question and identify to whom your question is directed. If we have time, we'll allow reporters to ask a second question. Again, you can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the queue at any time, and you can enter star two if you'd like to be removed from the queue. <coughs> First, we will go to Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Uh, yes, hi. CM SpaceX uh, launch is now taking priority. So what is the earliest um, you would conduct the demo test? Would you start from scratch? Um, how would that all work? Hi, Marsha. You were, you were kind of low and broken in the background, but um, this is Mike Seraf, and I'll, I'll say that we're staying in um, close contact and, and collaborate daily with our, um, our um, commercial crew and International Space Station and commercial LEO partners um, that are launching off the other pads. And um, we're aware that their, that their uh, primary launch attempts are coming up here soon. We're looking at our constraints uh, uh, relative to rolling in the lessons learned that, uh, that we just discussed. And, and it looks like we'll take um, uh, just about as much time um, uh, as they're going to need, to, as we're going to need, uh, for Axiom to uh, to fly. So we'll we'll fall in behind them. Um, exactly what date that is, uh, we've got to finish uh, sharpening the pencil on our open work. But we don't anticipate that it'll be too much longer than than after the Axiom launch. Thank you. Our next question is from Philip Sloss of NASA Space Flight. Thanks. Um, was the, the issue with the core stage locks chill down uh, that, that you ran into yesterday, how was it similar, if at all, or how is it different from the situation um, that, you, that, that, uh, uh, that you ran into at Stennis when you first attempted to load uh, liquid oxygen onto the core stage? Thanks. Hey, Philip, this is Tom. Let me take a little bit of that, but I'm going to turn it over to Charlie. You know, I, I went through the whole campaign at, at Stennis, uh, and, you know, and you're, you're right. We ran into the lock load is always it's a little tricky, right? And uh, it's more dense than hydrogen, and you have to worry about anti-geyser. So it has uh, the unique characteristics that make it, uh, particularly the initial part of the load, fairly challenging. We had a different situation going on at Stennis. We had to worry about the... Uh, the coldness of the locks. We were coming off barges and a run tank. And so we, they, they did a very similar thing. It's like the little puzzle thing I talked about where they looked at the different temperatures and flow parameters and sequencing, and they worked around that. Uh, it, it was somewhat similar. And I'll let Chattery talk about what we did this time. Uh, it was a, a slightly different cause for the challenge, but it, it fundamentally comes down to locks. It was fairly dense. You have to pump it. It takes a while to pump it. 
um, you know, you have to really worry about thermal condition as you go through the process, particularly at the start of the, the flow process. So it, it, it was a different um, challenge at Stennis, but uh, kind of many of the same uh, considerations. And, and Charlie, I don't know if, what, what you'd like to add to that. Uh, yeah, I would say um, Tom is absolutely correct. They were similar in that it that it had to do with your inlet temps, right, at the core stage. But the difference, I think, is that, um, and I'm not as familiar with the Stennis configuration, but ours is very unique to the upper stage and the configuration that supports not just a core stage load, but an upper stage load as well. And so as you think about, if you think about the, you know, core stage and the upper stage being higher and just having a, you know, a, a column, if you will, a, a vertical column of cryogenics, and, it, and certainly it wasn't, it was a small amount, but as you're loading, as you throttle that pump speed back, you're going to have some amount of that, that LOX that's in that upper stage, headed toward that upper stage skid, is going to come back down into your main flow stream, and that affects your temperatures, and that was fundamentally uh, what the, the issue was here. So it, it really was similar in that it had to do with the inlet temps, but it was different because it had to do with the, the upper stage and really the architecture of the, the loading um, that we have. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next question is from Eric Berger of Ars Technica. Hi, uh, thanks for doing this. First of all, I just wanted to say it was, it was kind of difficult to follow along the test on Sunday and Monday, like basic information when prop loading began and the test window could close. It just feel like it was lacking. I know you guys are working on that, but it was certainly noticeable. Um, second of all, uh, Charlie, you mentioned you made good progress on the test objectives, you know, but from an outside, from a non-engineer, it seems like the dynamic part of the test or really dynamic is like when you sort of start filling both tanks and topping off and so forth. So I'm just wondering, like, you know, how far do you feel like you've gotten? It's like if you're running a marathon, are you mile 5, 10, 20? I'm just trying to get a sense of like, you know, do you feel like you're really close or do you still have a lot ahead of you? Thanks. And so that's a tough one to answer because wet dress is certainly about cryogenics, um, but it is also about day of launch configuration and it is about all of your external interfaces. Um, so from an external interface, you know, with the range, the Johnson Space Center, you know, external commanding to the vehicle, um, all of those things were accomplished. Uh, as I said, the Orion configuration was verified. Uh, ICPS, so there's a significant amount of test objectives that were completed. With respect to the cryogenics, I mean, we got we got through um, our loading, uh, our LO2 loading to again about 50% on the core stage, but we still have the the core stage hydrogen load to go. We look forward to getting into that, and then we also have both commodities on the upper stage. So it's really hard to put a put a number to to what that is in terms of, you know, thinking about, you know, running that running that race, how far you got, but but I would characterize it as, uh, you know, a significant amount of our objectives have been completed. We certainly look forward to finishing out the cryo-loading operations and, as you stated, that dynamic phase of loading uh, and getting that objective behind us. Uh, Eric, this is uh, Mike Surf, and I'm, I'm going to just jump in here. I think Charlie's being modest. Um, and, and, I, and I say that because earlier this week, um, Charlie and I and, and a few others were discussing um, the preparations to even just get to the cryo-loading phase and, and what Charlie terms getting out of the pad, um, which is basically reconfiguring the vehicle from where you're doing um, preps and servicing just to have access to the vehicle. Um, and there's all sorts of... Um, guards and steel and um, platforms in place that um, are in place that you got to remove to get to the flight configuration and and I'll pause there Charlie and see if you have anything to add on that because I, I know that that was a, a significant um, timeline um, validation effort that that occurred earlier this week so I'll, I'll let you yeah. follow up on that yeah, one. Mike so thanks for that reminder you are correct so one of the things that I always tell folks is there are two I mean well, Anytime you're in launch countdown or wet dress, right, it, it's, it's a hard set of work to go do. But there are two pieces of that work that are really challenging. One is when you get into terminal count, and the other is getting out of the pad. And, uh, and it's really tough to get out of the pad. You have to get all the, you, know, you have to get everything configured uh, that has to be done locally. You have to get all of your work done. Um, all of the, you know, what I call big steel moved. I mean, you gotta get the engine service platform down, down the hill. 
Uh, you got to get the side flame deflectors in position. You got to get the extensible columns jacked. I mean, there is just a lot of work to go do, and all of that is is your critical path to tanking and your critical path to air to GN2 transfer. And so uh, we were able to go through and demonstrate all of that work um, and get through that. And that is a is a big deal for us. One of the one of the test objectives for wet dress was to go through your timelines in some of these critical areas and demonstrate, uh, you know, what those are and see how they, the, how the as runs compared to your plan timeline so that you have all of that data and you can put those together for, for launch. So, yeah, Mike, thanks for that reminder. Thank you. Our next question is from Stephen Clark with Spaceflight Now. Thank you, Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Just wanted to follow up a little bit on the valve, vent valve issue yesterday. Um, that the actuation panel, I understand, is on the mobile launcher itself. Um, has the team gotten out there to take a look at that valve and uh, determine the cause of uh, why, the, I guess, the primary and the redundant uh, valves were not responding? Yes, we got teams out to the pad today, and after inspection, we found that the uh, the manual hand valve was in the the closed position and uh, should have been open. Thank you. Our next question is from Marcia Smith of Space Policy Online. Thanks so much. Uh, I'd like to pick up on a question that Marcia Dunn asked because I, I didn't catch the answer. And she had asked whether or not you had to start from scratch when you do this again, or, or do you pick up where you left off? How much more of it do you have to do? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, we don't have to start from scratch. Um, we're at a really good hold point. We can get some other work done out at the pad, um, you know, while we're getting configured, while we're topping off commodities. But we don't go all the way back to the beginning, which kind of puts us at an advantage um, for uh, when we start back up. Um, we're laying out those timelines right now, uh, and so we'll have those a little bit later, but it won't be all the way back to the beginning. If you recall, when we started, we had a couple of days of preps, and then we had two, you know, the wet dress itself was about two days long, so that was about four days. Uh, and so this time we're looking at something significantly shorter, I would say something in about the 36-hour uh, time frame. Thank you. Our next question is from Chris Gabehart of NASA Space Flight. Uh, yes, thanks, Charlie. From a, from a team perspective, I'm, I'm curious, I know you have a little bit more flexibility on these test days than you would on launch day, but about how late in the day could you actually go for those two final terminal count runs based on coming in and starting your tanking meetings at around 7 from a, from a crew rest and, and, and a crew health standpoint? Thank you. So we like to keep the length of day, you know, 12 hours or less, uh, ideally. And so we had planned to start our tanking at 7 and then to finish up about 2.30 in the afternoon, understanding that we still had several, you know, a couple of hours of drain left at the end. Thank you. Our next question is from Christopher Kokinos of Astronomy Magazine. Yeah, hi, thank you for doing this, uh, and uh, good luck as you continue. I just had actually a, a quick clarification question and, uh, and then, and then a, a, a larger question. The clarification is <clears throat> you talked about GN2. Is that the gaseous nitrogen? And it's just unclear to me what that outage, I'm quoting from your blog, an outage with a vendor of gaseous nitrogen required for taking operations or preparations. I'm just wondering if what that was more precisely. And just to be clear, you're not pulling back to the – the VAB, uh, is that correct? For the next, you're just going to leave it out on the pad and, and then get to the next abbreviated wet dress rehearsal. Thank you. Yes, we are remaining at the pad in preparation for our next wet dress rehearsal attempt. Um, with regard to the issue um, that they had with the supply, I, I can certainly share. I don't have full insight since it's um, um, not something that I directly work with. But as I understand it, or what was reported to us, is that they had a vaporizer that froze up. Um, there was a LN2 leak that affected um, the, the entire capability, and so they had to, because it froze, they had to bring the capability down momentarily, allow it to warm up, and then reinstate it. So we certainly had capability uh, once they uh, secured the area that they had the issue with. Uh, and then, um, as I said, let, let the equipment warm up and then started to, to resupply GN2 uh, to the pipeline. Yeah. And, and to be real, 
Christopher, this is Mike Serf. To be real clear on this, this is a commercial supplier that's off the uh, the Kennedy Space Center facility that supplies uh, gaseous nitrogen that's used to inert um, volumes of the of the vehicle, um, and we're not the only user of that supply. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next question is from Kenneth Chang of New York Times. Okay, thank you. So this is following up on Chris Kephart's uh, question. If you hadn't had the valve problem with the liquid nitrogen, would you have done the full count countdown? Um, does that seem like it would have ended at 10 or 11 at night? We would have, um, if we, let me see. So we would have had, we would have started the tanking operations earlier had we not had the, the, um, the GN2 supply issue um, that delayed us. But we still would have run into an issue with the, uh, with the pneumatic um, valve out on the uh, mobile launcher, and that would have ultimately still caused us to, uh, to delay the, the hydrogen load. Yeah, and, and, and I kind of was your question that, or was the question if we had the valve, the LH2 valve, um, the hydrogen valve properly configured? I think the answer was we would have gone into the hydrogen load and see how far we and, and And Charlie would have a better way of saying it. But if we hadn't had the valve in the wrong configuration, we would have gone into the hydrogen load, and we couldn't go any farther with the LOX load until we started loading hydrogen at that point. So we would have proceeded, and then it would have been up to Charlie to decide uh, how far we could get in our operations. Is that, did I get that right, Charlie? Or? No, you got it right, Tom. Thank you. <clears throat> our next question is from George Dvorsky of Gizmodo. Hi, everybody. Um, the sense I'm getting is that the issues that have been experienced over the last several days are nothing of a really major variety. And I do understand, of course, that there needs to be a, a more thorough investigation of, of the wet dress and, uh, of course, the subsequent one that's to follow. But am I to understand that there's really nothing been too alarming, nothing too catastrophic, and that, you know, we're not really talking about anything, um, you know, potentially problematic in terms of um, the pace of where the program is at right now. Thanks very much. Yep. Hi, George. This is Mike Seraf. And um, yes, that is correct. I mean, we haven't run into any fundamental design flaws or design issues. These are these are um, what I'll characterize as is you know nuisance or or just kind of technical uh, issues where we're we're learning um, features and systems um, uh, that uh, we characterized in in uh, subscale testing but when you put it all together um, you, you learn where some of your uncertainties are and, um, and and we're working our way through that you know we've done a remarkable amount of, of um, ground testing at the component level <clears throat> uh, whether it's uh, structural and loads and dynamics testing or or uh, software and avionics testing but when you put it all together and then you add the uh, the natural environment factors, and then the uh, cryogenic temperatures, and and all the other factors involved. Um, sometimes you learn you learn um, that the full system is slightly different than the subscale, and and that's what we're working through right now. But uh, but you're correct that that none of these are are major major issues that we need to overcome. We're just we just need to work our way through it so that we can yeah. be efficient when it comes time to do this for uh, for launch day. Yeah, George, it'll just be super duper clear. The Mega Moon rockets, it's fine. And everything we just talked about is that partnership we have between the rocket and the facility that works together to get us in a, in a launch uh, condition. And so, you know, we're learning stuff, we're figuring out pieces of the puzzle, and, and that's good. But, you know, from a flight hardware perspective, we haven't seen anything uh, in these operations that would, um, it's really on the, on the, on the flight side. It's, it's really kind of marrying up the rocket to our ground system and getting them to work together. And this dance we talked about, it's just a uh, complicated one to work through it. I think the team's doing a really good job. Thank you. Our next question is from Raman Skvita of Wired Magazine. Hi, uh, thank you. I was just wanted to ask. Uh, this is mainly a question for Charlie or, or maybe uh, Mike. Um, I just wanted to ask. You know, how does it feel to be, um, you know, so close to um, getting this, this, you know, this huge rocket finally ready for launch? Um, I mean, is, is it feeling exciting, or is it also maybe a little bit, uh, I don't know, nerve-wracking or frustrating to come across these, uh, you know, technical problems uh, and, and, you know, the, the also with, with the problem with the fans and then this valve 
like uh, uh, I mean, I'm assuming you're hoping this would be done um, already. Um, is this pretty standard, or is it, or, or, or is it maybe a little bit um, frustrating having uh, these, um, you know, delays to deal with? Well, see, Mike, I'll I'll take that one first, and then you can add to it. So. You know, I would tell you that we are at a very exciting point in our program. I mean, I've been working on this um, since 2014, and uh, and so to have this amazing vehicle at the pad, you know, I'll tell you, yesterday when I came in, I pulled into the Launch Control Center parking lot, and and I actually walked walked down toward the road, and I stood there for a minute, and I just looked out at the pad. It was dark, you know, I came in, it's early in the morning, and uh, before sunrise, and I stood there for just a minute, and I looked out at the pad, and I thought, wow, you know, uh, this is an incredible vehicle, uh, an incredible capability that is going to return us to the moon and one day take us on to Mars. And I'm standing here in the parking lot, looking out at the pad at it, and thinking about this test that's in front of us that demonstrates our day of launch capability and how close we are to that. So it is exciting. Um, it's exciting for the team. You know, would we have loved to have finished the test yesterday? You bet. Um, but I think that we do our best work. I think NASA does some of its best work when it is solving problems because I think that's part of what calls us to this, right? It's, it's that curiosity, it's that love of exploration, but it's also the fact that you have these things that you're going to meet head on and you're going you're gonna to go solve. And, uh, and so I couldn't be more proud of our team and the work that they've completed so far and, and their creativity yesterday when they encountered an issue of figuring out, okay, you know, this, this locks loading didn't quite work the way that, that we expected it to in our software, but we're going to sit down and we're going to figure out a way to make it work. And they did. So um, I may have rambled on a little bit there for your question, but um, Mike, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, I, I, I kind of I have a mix of feelings here. Um, you know, it feels familiar but different, and I'm also appreciative. Um, and. and the familiar part is, you know, the physics are the same. Many of the risks are the same as, as per other programs that I've worked. And um, just the, the dedication of the team. Um, but, we, but it's different because we have a new vehicle. And, and while we have many of the same team members, everybody's in a different role. This is the first time this team is flying this particular vehicle and getting ready to execute this particular uh, program, the Artemis program. So, so there are some differences. And then, and then the appreciation aspect is really of um, our forefathers um, and, and just a recognition of how hard it is to get through this first time um, uh, build and production and test program and get through the first flight. Um, because, you know, speaking for myself, I took that for granted. Um, you know, every program that I worked up until recently um, was an established program, and, and I worked the operational aspects of it. And we didn't have to learn some of these nuances and characteristics that we talked about here uh, that we're learning here at Wet Dress or any of the prior testing that's been done or prior training that's been done. So, so you know, familiar but different uh, with appreciation is, is kind of how I'd answer your, your question. Yeah, and I, let me add that, you know, I did the shuttle program, and, you know, there's just a lot of attention. You know, we, we would have things come up, up periodically in the shuttle program, and, you know, we had done it hundreds of times, and still things come up, and you just kind of deal with it and, and move forward. I think the team's doing a tremendous job. You know, historically, if you look at this type of stuff, they're doing really good. I, I can't be prouder of um, the, 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 the ground uh, team that we have and the OEMs that are doing this in our international partnership. I'm not seeing anything, you know, the mega rockets doing good. And, uh, you know, these are not, I think there's just a lot of attention right now because it's such an incredible new capability and people are really interested, which we're really glad <laughs> that people are that interested. But, you know, but based on my history, and I've been through a lot of this stuff, this is, this is the kind of thing that you'll run into and they're working their way through it. And I think they're really, actually, I, I think my impression is they're just doing an incredible job. I wish, you know, yesterday when they worked through the little puzzle of getting the locks loaded, that was just absolutely incredible. So I'm, I'm actually uh, very positive about the team and I think they're doing good stuff. It's just, uh, you know, these, these 
type of things do come up and, and they're working their way through it. And I think we'll have a, a number come, coming up here in a couple of days and, and we'll see how we do. I think it's, it's, it's actually, I'm, I'm feeling pretty positive about the whole thing. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Manuel Mazzanti from Debate. Hi, how are you? Manuel Masanti covering the space program in Spanish. Two quick questions. I wonder, I would like to have your comments on how well the, how well the weather behaved during this test. It looks like our nature uh, received the memo that they said it was going to be tested and responded in kind, even with light storms. So I wonder that it is super helpful to uh, check different systems. So I would like to hear your opinion on that. And my second question is, does this minor delay affect in some way the June launch window. Thank you. Uh, uh, Manuel, this is uh, Mike Serafin. So um, as far as the weather is concerned, um, I, I would say we saw the full extreme of what you can have for weather. Um, you know, we saw what our own meteorologist classified as strong to severe on Saturday. Um, which gave our lightning protection system an opportunity to demonstrate its capability and protect the 32-story tall rocket sitting out there on the launch pad, and it did a fantastic job. Um, and then um, Sunday and Monday during our wet dress rehearsal attempts, I mean, we saw remarkably good weather. The winds were very low, um, uh, Monday in particular. Uh, again, our meteorologist classified it as superb, um, and and it was in the 70s. The you know the winds were low. It was a beautiful sunny day. I, I don't think we could have asked for better test conditions. Um, we just we just ran into uh, challenges with with some of the some of the systems getting through it. Um, and the second part of your question, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, oh, the, 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 the no, June launch can... window. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's. It, it, we're we're not ready to give up on it yet, and and we've we'll, we'll reassess after wet dress as far as um, is where we stand relative to any any work that we pick up. I don't know, Tom, if you have anything to to add to that. Yeah, let's get through wet dress. We'll get another shot here in a couple of days. It's a great question, and I think we'll be in a much better position to answer it. Um, you know, when we get through the wet dress, like I said, I'm very positive. The team's incredible, actually. And uh, we just had a couple of things come up. They came up during the shuttle program, just so you know. Uh, it's just so we're getting a lot of attention with this activity. And so uh, we'll get through the wet dress, and I think we'll be in a much better position to talk about where we think we are for the launch. Um, but once again, I can't, I can't emphasize enough. The vehicle is doing pretty good. We were just working our way through a couple things, which were we saw this at the Green Run as well, by the way, and we saw it during the shuttle program. And uh, I, I'm really proud of the team. I think Charlie and, and Mike and the team are just doing a tremendous job. Thank you. Our next question is from Michael Greshko of National Geographic. Hi, thanks so much. I think this uh, would be for Mike, but just to follow up on uh, George's earlier question, is there anything that you've seen in the, the first um, attempt here that would uh, complicate or, or lengthen any of the, uh, sort of the checkouts and refurbishment that you all have planned once um, you roll it back to the VAB after the uh, wet dress rehearsal? Thanks. Uh, yeah, Michael, I, I would just say no. Um, you know, it, most of the stuff we're picking up is is small or procedural in nature. Um, you know, some of it is is you know we need to adjust some of the limits uh, slightly or some of the sequencing or timing slightly. Um, as far as the hardware, you know, Tom Tom said it well. You know, the the rocket is fine, the spacecraft is fine. Um, we we just we just got to get through the test and the test objectives and and. Um, you know, we, we, when we get through the test, we'll we'll see what the um, what if any additive work there is. But right now, we're not tracking anything significant. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next question is from Bill Harwood of CBS News. Um, hey, thank you very much, um, Charlie. Is there any way you can maybe give us a better idea of what geysering means when we're talking about cryogenic oxygen? That's just one of those words that will catch a reader's attention. In other words, what is the concern? What actually can happen? And what's the concern? Thanks. Sure. Well, let's see. 
you know, geysering can occur when you have heat that enters your liquid oxygen feed system. And what can happen with that is you actually can form like a large oxygen gas bubble that can rapidly kind of expel. And, and when it does that, if you think about it, it displaces large volumes of heavy liquid, so LOX is heavy. And so it does, it can kind of create this geyser effect, if you will. Um, the way that we mitigate that is you actually have what we call helium inject, and it uses helium, and you inject that into your feed line system, and it helps to, to cool it down. Um, and um, that's, that's the, the what we call anti-geyser, um, is that we use helium to, to provide that cooling. Uh, and so it allows the, um, the, the heat to escape. So I don't know if that helps at all, um, but that's kind of what the the, the geyser protection is for is that you don't want a, a big you know big big slug of, of warm locks you know going into your your feed system we monitor that very carefully because we want to make sure that you know we're not creating that that um, that warm effect where you can create that um, that that big bubble if you will that can be expelled and then cause some problems yeah and let me add first of all to try, it was a great explanation. It literally is the tricky commodity is locks because the guys, you can look it up. This is where I give me anything. Uh, hydrogen actually flows pretty well. <laughs> you worry about leaks with hydrogen, but it's much easier to pull up the hydrogen. So, you know, Eric asked about the marathon. I, I, I grew up, uh, went to school in Boston, and I would certainly say if you're taking a marathon, uh, getting through the initial locks flow is this the taking the hill during the marathon. If you can get past that, doesn't mean you're completed your marathon, but it's a pretty good milestone. And, and that was one of the things they accomplished is really figuring out um, uh, how to get through the thing that Charlie just described, which is a tricky part of what we do. Thank you. Our next question is Zach Aubert from the Launchpad News. Yes, thank you, Zach Aubert with the Launchpad News. Um, with the restrictions on the launch window for Artemis 1 looking forward, how long is SLS able to stay out on the pad for testing before it really has to be rolled back to the VAB to have enough time for final preparations? And what really are those before it may consider missing its June window, not because of the wet dress? And just a point of curiosity, last night we saw the pad stay dark on the uh, the cameras that we were getting as media. Just out of curiosity, why lights weren't turned on? Was it just because the pad was cleared and just being drained? Thank you. Uh, Tom, do you want me to take the uh, how long is the vehicle at the pad, or do you want that one? Yeah, no, I go ahead. Yeah, we've got some time. You know, with their – go ahead, Mike, and and, and I'll maybe I'll add it to the sub. Go yeah, ahead. I, yeah, Zach, I, I would just say that yeah, we do have some time. Um, we've we've got a um, a load um, spectrum constraint that um, is a design constraint, um, and it assumes certain things. It assumes uh, certain meteorological conditions, certain winds. The rocket is very tall; um, it's 32 stories tall. And as it sits out there on the pad, uh, when the winds blow against it, um, it does create a load, a bending moment. Um, so they factored in a, a natural environment constraint, and uh, we are we are well below that constraint. Um, you know, we've got um, ample margin, not only for the wet dress, but uh, rollout for flight. Um, but but that is uh, probably our driving constraint. Um, in, in order to get the uh, the vehicle ready and and um, yeah, Charlie, Charlie said a really interesting thing, and you probably guys said, you know, we got some primary objectives done. One was the range uh, um, the thing, so we don't have normally what we're looking at is you know we we've got range batteries and stuff like that. That's the typically a limiting factor. We got through that test with the range. That's a really big deal. So it gives us a lot of flexibility to be out of the pad, and you know, really just paced about updating the the documentation. Charlie's doing a great job getting that sequence built back into the system. We'll get right back on out there. It's not going to be, it's going to be, we'll probably have a date for you here later on uh, tonight or tomorrow, but it's, uh, we'll put a blog out, but it's just going to, a couple more days we'll be back out there. So and we got plenty of time uh, at the pad. There's no, no big constraining factor for a while. Okay, and, and Zach, to, to your question about the, the lighting, I, I think it was just the, uh, the, the contrast with the ambient lighting um, at that particular time of day uh, relative to the camera field of view. Um, 
it just just happened to line up so that it appeared dark but it, i can promise you it is not dark at the pad <laughs> regardless of the time of day you go out there thanks and that's actually all the questions that we have time for today um <clears throat> Uh, you can listen to a replay of this teleconference online by visiting the Media Resources tab at nasa.gov slash Artemis-1 later, uh, later today. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. To follow along with updates for the wet dress rehearsal, please go to the Artemis blog at blog.nasa.gov slash Artemis. And you can also view uh, the rocket on the pad with the live video stream on the KSC Newsroom YouTube channel. Thanks again, and that will conclude our call. So there we go, uh, a, a pretty detailed update, uh, lots of information from the NASA team on uh, the cause of the scrub. Pretty uh, sad to hear that the, the main reason they had to scrub was because someone flipped a switch the wrong way, but you know what? This is all for learning, and uh, that's why they have this time. Super excited we got to be in there on the, the last question, and uh, they didn't fully go into how I thought they would answer it, but it was, uh, I think, still some information that was good to hear on what the restraints are of how long they can stay out on the pad. Um, so I uh, appreciate their time and their response there. And uh, knowing that the pad was lit up last night, because uh, we were kind of getting mixed reports from people on the ground and on the camera. So uh, always good to know that the pad is lit up there. We are going to send you guys all back over to our 24-7 pad cam as we await a new T0. No T0 set at this time, but they are referencing days. So hopefully we'll see something by the end of the week. But for now, this is Zach from the TLP Network Studio signing off. If you guys have more questions, join us over on Discord. We're in live comms, or we'll be answering those in our 24-7 pad cam uh, chat area. And this is Zach signing off. We'll see you next time.